Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jane Harmon, the now year-old uh, president and CEO of the Wilson Center. Time flies when you're having fun. And I came down here to get my friend Ira Shapiro to uh, autograph my book. I'm not gonna, I sent you the real one. I'm not going to autograph this soft thing. <laughs> <laughs> you autograph this one. <laughs> what you need to know is that uh, in another century, Ira and I were Senate staffers together uh, before the best years, um, before the last great Senate. Uh, but that uh, we knew each other, we worked together. I worked then for California Senator John Tunney. Um, a lot of the people described in this book were assembled just a few weeks ago at uh, John Culver's house. Um, and uh, everyone remembers that period. Uh, and uh, everyone remembers a time, sadly, when people were focused on solving problems, not blaming the other side. Um, and the timing of this uh, additional event for IRA is uh, interesting because we are seeing uh, the exodus of the moderates on the Hill. I'm sure that will be commented on by uh, uh, Adam and, and Janet and, and, and others in this panel. Uh, but it is just heartbreaking to me, uh, uh, someone who was always called a bipartisan Democrat, uh, to see the exodus of uh, Olympia Snow, David Dreyer, and others just in the last 10 minutes uh, from the Congress. Both of them are terrific, as are some of the Democrats who have announced their resignation. And um, uh, today in the article about David Dreyer, it, it even says, it would describe in the Post, it describes how eight uh, senior members of the California delegation uh, are leaving the House uh, during this term or at the end of it, and that it started with me. So um, I don't know if I should be uh, applauded or blamed, but uh, in my case, uh, the Wilson Center offered me a challenge I could not decline, and uh, it has met my expectations, because what we have here is a bipartisan, uh, what we call safe political space, where tough issues can be uh, debated uh, and, and studied, uh, and uh, done in a, and that, that effort is done in a civil and mutually respectful way, and um, that was the good old days. That's what Ira will talk about. Um, the timing of your book, Ira, is amazing. It's not unlike the timing of Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs, um, I think. I think so. I, um, but in this case, <laughs> you're not dead. Uh, and uh, and um, your book isn't just about personalities. It's about what those personalities represented. As I said, bipartisanship, putting the country in good policy making first. Uh, the Senate, you describe, worked that way because of a strong, solid core of moderates uh, in both parties. And uh, I mentioned how sad we are to see some of the good guys leave. Um, and let me just finally say that Kent Hughes, who's the organizer of this event and the director of the Wilson Center's Project in on America and the Global Economy, is someone also, who I think ascribes to that notion of, of uh, putting public policy in the, in the country first. So I'm turning this over to uh, Kent, but I, I just do want to say to all of you um, that not only is Ira in the right, uh, in, in the point of view he takes in the book, but he was one of the good guys uh, for a long time uh, in the United States Senate. And um, he went on to law practice and to an attempted run for Congress in another era, and uh, I supported him, by the way, proudly. And um, I, uh, I think that what our goal has to be, and I don't know how we get there from here, is to uh, reinvent or restore a politics that makes our own kids want to run for office. And as a mother of four kids, none of whom would even entertain this idea, uh, I think this is a huge challenge. So Ira. It's up to you, buddy. Uh, we're all counting on you to fix it. And uh, please welcome uh, our, uh, our, our, our very esteemed um, program director, Kent Hughes. Thank you, Jane. Jane was too modest to mention that she was a nine-term member of Congress, served on all the key national security committees, and now serves on the key advisory committees that deal with the same subjects on behalf of the administration. And uh, she is moving us, she didn't mention this either, moving us to Wilson Center 
and serendipitously we're having a retreat uh, dedicated to 3.0 tomorrow. An advance, an advance, right? I stand corrected. Well, it's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce this distinguished panel and, of course, Ira Shapiro, who I've known for many years, uh, although I didn't actually meet Ira first on the Hill. We met at the midterm convention in Philadelphia, as I remember, <laughs> a long time ago. But I worked on the Hill through this period and knew and worked for some of the people that he mentions in his book. And I remember vividly how much it changed in, uh, in, as a new set of senators swept in after the election of 1980. Well, not only do we have uh, Ira, let me get back to him in just a moment, we have an extremely distinguished panel of journalists who know the Congress, who covered the Congress, who have really helped define, I say, our public understanding of the Congress. To my, I'll do this alphabetically, to my far left, Adam Clymer, who I'm sure all of you know from many years of his reporting on the Congress and other key political questions for the New York Times. He has, uh, as you'd suspect, a number of awards. I won't emphasize that. You have your bios in front of you. Uh, and Janet Hooks, who I'm just thrilled to meet. I watch her all the time on Washington Week in Review. And she, of course, has also covered the Congress, including a, a period with CQ, as I remember. Yes, the uh, oh, I, excuse. I'm from Oregon. We tend to forget that there's another state out there <laughs> on the West Coast, and uh, Janet is now, of course, with the uh, the Wall Street Journal. And thank you, David Wessel, for suggesting Janet as a possible commentator. And of course, it's an enormous pleasure to introduce my old friend Ira Shapiro, who not only worked with distinction for key members of the Senate but went on in the Clinton administration to be an ambassador at the uh, Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, did a number of key uh, negotiations, including those with Japan, uh, went on to be a very prominent trade attorney here in town, but thought about the way in which the world of the Hill had changed. And to his credit, he put pen to paper. And uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of you, but I like the way you ended your book where you said, well, last could have two meanings. It could be the last ever great Senate, or it could be the most recent great Senate, with maybe you'll fill us with some hope for the future. Ira, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kent. Um, and we had such a distinguished gathering that I'll try not to speak too long so we hear from the other panelists and from the floor, uh, so this won't be a filibuster. Um, but I will say that certain things never change. When I met Jane in late 1975 or 1976, this is unfashionable to say, so I'll say it anyway. I was rather struck that Jane was so brilliant and beautiful, and so that's never really changed. Um, she was a very distinguished staff person at that time. She was the, one of the first women uh, to run an important subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee. She was a real uh, leader on every constitutional issue. I remember re writing a speech for Gaylord Nelson about habeas corpus, and he delivered it rather well, but the only thing that really mattered to me was when Jane came up to me and told me it was a great speech, so I really appreciated it. Um, and I'm a great admirer. Take the water too. I'm a great admirer of her truly wonderful career. I'm an admirer also of our, the panelists, Janet Hook, who I have seen on TV. But I'm particularly in debt to Adam Clymer. Uh, he's written. He may have written more, but he wrote two distinguished books that I relied on: his Kennedy biography of Senator Edward Kennedy, uh, and his book about the Panama Canal. Uh, which is really about the politics of the Panama Canal fight, which had a profound effect on politics in America. I think it was one of the first, uh, one of the first real turning points in the politics. So let me, um, let me say some things about the book. Uh, I, I did spend time in the Senate uh, in 1975 through 1987. And I stayed interested in it, as we all do. Uh, 2008, a group of friends 
uh, six friends who had worked together 30 years before, uh, would come together. We decided to have breakfast together because the presidential campaign was so exciting. And eventually, we'd always get around to the question of how much we had loved the Senate when we worked there and how it was virtually unrecognizable to us. It had turned into something that we simply couldn't recognize at all. And one time after those breakfasts, I walked out and said, I'm going to write a book about the Senate when it was great. So I announced this to my friends the next time we got together for breakfast, and they all sort of chuckled, and one of them said, great, pass the toast, or something like that. <laughs> they didn't really believe I was going to write a book, but I kept plugging away. And actually, it wasn't that hard. Writing a book is supposed to be an ordeal. Uh, but I got so much enthusiasm from the people I talked to about it that it was a great idea to try to recapture that, those senators and that Senate. That, that, that enthusiasm really carried me forward. And you have a couple of threshold questions that you run into at the beginning. You start out reading everything you can. And the first threshold question you run into is, did it only seem great because I was there? And did it only seem great because I was young? I mean, we all have a tendency to sort of have a nostalgia for certain things, and memory plays tricks on you. But as I looked at it, I became quite convinced that we actually had a great Senate in a particular period of time, which I concluded actually was about 1963 through 1980, that we had a great Senate for that period of time, and that not only did we have a great Senate that was different than what we have today? We had a great Senate that was different than what came before it. And indeed, I called the book the last great Senate, but I might have called it the first great Senate or the only great Senate. Because if you look at American history, what you discover is there's a bunch of great senators that we could name over the years. But the idea of the Senate working the way the founders wanted it to work, really a group of wise men and women now, it was only really wise men then with the exception of Margaret Chase Smith and then Nancy Kassebaum at the end, but really working together in the national interest, bringing wisdom and intelligence and experience and independence to bear and actually dealing with the nation's problems. And what you discover quite early, and I, I'm sure you've read these books, but what I discovered quite early was that the Senate, particularly in the 20th century, large periods of time, it was a reactionary force, basically. It wasn't just mildly conservative. It was reactionary. And it held back the progress of the country for a long period of time. And the danger of that is that, I mean, the danger of that is that the country doesn't move forward. But the Senate is in some ways profoundly undemocratic based on the constitutional agreement to give two senators to each state uh, despite population. It was a compromise that was necessary, but it's profoundly undemocratic by our, 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 com our current views, uh, which have to do with one man, one vote. And the undemocratic nature of it was magnified over the years by the seniority system. And so that you had a situation, I'm not even getting to the filibuster yet, but you had a situation where as late as through the 1960s, and it, I think even the beginning of 1970, eight major committees of the Senate were chaired by four states, senators from Georgia, Louisiana, Arkansas, Rick Perry moment, and Mississippi uh, controlled eight led eight committees, including the four most powerful. The reason this is important is it has to work as a group of wise men or now wise men and women to overcome that undemocratic nature. They have to really be bringing something to it to make it worthwhile. And what I discovered was between 1963 and 1980, we had a Senate that was a progressive Senate 
that was in the forefront of everything that went on in the country from that, in that period, working with presidents where possible, holding them accountable where necessary, pushing them where, where appropriate. The Senate broke the logjam and, and rectified the historic injustice with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and then it went on to be partner with President Johnson in the Great Society programs, and it went on from there to be the forum that questioned the Vietnam War and ultimately produced the challenges to Johnson. It was the place where the country first understood what Watergate was about because of the Senate Watergate Committee. And you can go on and on through the 60s and the 70s and you find the Senate at the forefront of everything. And so I called it, and the names, I mean, look, the names of those people, Humphrey and Muskie and Javits and Baker and Irvin and Byrd and, you know, at, at one of my, Bernie Sanders interviewed me on C-SPAN and he read the 30 names I had there. We were on TV, he just kept reading these names, and I was thinking, that's a lot of names to read. But those senators resonated in their states and in the country. We still think of them as terrific senators. So I guess if you're going to take the position that something is great, whether it's a great Senate or great senators, you have to be willing to sort of define it and why it was great and sort of explain it. There's a temptation, by the way, to define great, a great senator it's sort of the way Potter Stewart wants to find pornography. You, can't, you know it when you see it. And to some extent, if you were around the Senate, you did know it when you saw it. But I've tried to do a little more than that and, and tried to tell this. And I, the book is a narrative. It's not political science. It tells the story of the Senate over a period of years. But so what made, what made the Senate great? Well, first, it was clearly an unusual group of people. And Tom Brokaw's Greatest Generation doesn't need footnotes from me. But there's no doubt that the generation that came out of World War II, the Ke John Kennedy generation, but many others who came out of World War II, went back to their states, became party builders, mostly progressives. They were an extraordinary group of people. They had a confidence in themselves. They had a belief in the country. They had a faith in government. And because they knew America's strength, they were willing to try to deal with its weaknesses. Plus, we had a strong economy, and they were able to have the resources to deal with his weaknesses. So it was a very wonderful confluence of things that made these people the kind of leaders they are. And they also had a sense of common purpose and shared experience. And so the way they dealt with each other had that, that sense of common purpose pervaded them. But it wasn't just, I mean, it wasn't just the quality of the senators, in my view. And it wasn't even just the great staff that they had, many of whom went on to become leaders, as Jane did, in, in the Congress, in the Senate. We've got senators who were former staffers. We've got great media people who are uh, tremendous veterans of the Senate. But it wasn't just the quality of the people. It was the concept of the Senate they had that differentiated them. They basically, I like to say that senators take a pledge to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, but there was an unspoken pledge, an unspoken oath that they took, and that was they had the privilege of being senators, six-year term, usually multiple terms. They could range wide on issues or they could drill deep on issues. And in return for the privilege of being a senator, when they sorted out the pressures on them, they were members of their party, they represented states, but it was the national interest that mattered most. That's what, what they were there for. They were there to work on things in the national interest. And that's the way they behaved, basically. Some of the things that I write about in the book, and I'll, I'll get to that briefly, but you can't, 
explain their conduct other than the fact that they saw the national interest and they did things that weren't always in their political interest. So they had this concept of the national interest. But the second thing that made them unique is they were devoted to the Senate. They were devoted to the institution of the Senate as a rock of the Republic and an institution that had to take collective action. Mike Mansfield, and I could go on and probably will go on for hours about Mike Mansfield, but Mike Mansfield, who was the longest serving majority leader in history, said, he gave a memorable speech and when he basically said, ultimately it's not the individual senators that matter, it's the Senate that's the rock of the Republic. And that meant, even though they pursued their individual agendas strongly, Ultimately, they had to come together, substantial debate, then principled compromise. People won sometimes and they lost sometimes, but that's the way they did business. Humphrey and Goldwater didn't agree on very many things, although they liked each other enormously. But the truth is their concept of the Senate was such that they, they shared that concept of the Senate. And the last thing, that's two elements, and the third element that I've, I've defined, and it started from Mansfield, in my view. M Mike Mansfield, not as famous as Lyndon Johnson. Thanks to Robert Caro, we'll all always know that Lyndon Johnson was a master of the Senate. And of course he was. He dragged the Senate kicking and screaming into the 20th century. From my standpoint, the Senate only got great after Johnson became vice president and then president. The Senate got great in the early 60s, in part because Mansfield took over. Mansfield was completely the opposite of Johnson in every respect. He was laconic, he never, he never looked for publicity, he really didn't think the majority leader should take credit for midnight deals that were made in a lubricated Senate. You know, he, he just, he was completely different. What he did was he instilled mutual trust and respect as the sort of a central core of the way the Senate worked. The first time Mansfield sort of explained the way he was going to lead, with kind of with the golden rule, you know, I'll treat you the way I expect to be treated, basically. Everett Dirksen thought he was kidding. He didn't think you could possibly run the Senate that way. And for a while, Mansfield's, in the beginning, Mansfield's democratized, his democratized Senate, treating everyone well with all the senators stepping up to their responsibilities, it quickly became paralyzed, absolutely paralyzed, because they didn't know how to do it. They were used to Johnson. But in the course of the Civil Rights Act of 64, they met the challenges of history, and then they went on. It was no longer going to be the graveyard of progressive dreams. It was going to be the place that you went to translate those dreams into legislation. So I don't think you can really understand the great Senate without understanding Mansfield and his role. Um, I decided to write the book. My first thought was to write about 18 years, basically. The group that came in in 1962, the wonderful senators that included Ribicoff, Nelson, By, McGovern, Dan Inouye, who's still there, of course, and the youngest one riding on his, fa his brother's famous name, Ted Kennedy. I was going to follow them for 18 years. My publisher suggested he didn't want me trudging through 18 years of the great Senate. So I decided to tell the story by focusing, I call it the last great Senate, it's basically the last years of the great Senate, the late 70s. Uh, <laughs> I told my agent what I was going to do. She said, oh, that sounds really good. Great legislative battles of the Carter years. That'll sell well. <laughs> and I said, well, maybe I'll call it the last great Senate. That might be better. And she said, all right, that might be better. So I decided to write about it. But the reason I did it was it's a, it's, a, it's a unique moment in time. The Vietnam War has ended badly, but it's ended. Watergate's over, Nixon's left the scene. It's the beginning of America's third century. 
We've got a new president, an outside president, Jimmy Carter, been elected. And we have new Senate leaders. Robert Byrd and Howard Baker have just come in. And Tip O'Neill's now the new speaker. It's the only time in the 20th century that all those things changed at once. And so we pick up, basically, the Senate, the assertive Senate that's used to dealing with the imperial presidency. We pick it up at that point, and we follow it through. But the other thing that's interesting about it, and the reason I liked writing about that period, is because it was a messy, difficult period where we had a weakened economy, we had energy problems, we had budget problems, we had headlines and disasters in Iran and Afghanistan. It really sounds like it was ripped from today's headlines and vice versa. The 70s, late 70s, were a lot like today, not identical. But there was one difference. And Jimmy Carter, who, by the way, is reading the book, allegedly, doesn't, we haven't heard anything bad from him yet. Mondale liked the book, but we don't know about Carter yet. Jimmy Carter, in his White House diary, said, in his comments to it last year, said, President Obama is dealing with a lot of the same problems that I dealt with. But I had, one diff I had one advantage. I had a Congress that worked on a bipartisan basis. And by that, he meant he had a Senate that worked on a bipartisan basis because both Carter and Obama had a Democratic House and a strong speaker trying to get things done. But the Senate was completely different. So I won't tell you everything that's in the book, but I go through a number of things just in one year where the Senate steps up to one thing after another. Adam Clymer's book about the Panama Canal fights uh, was a good example. The Senate goes on from there to sell, to prove the sale of F-15s to Saudi Arabia, very controversial, only had to be done on a bipartisan basis, could only be done that way. And you go through these fights and you see these people showing great courage and statesmanship and bipartisanship all the time. Howard Baker, I can't say enough about Senator Baker, and I won't get into it at great length until we talk a little more, but there's so little resemblance between the leader Howard Baker was and what we've seen in the last 20 years from my Republican leaders. It, it, it literally defies description. Uh, and we can get into that. So the other thing about the late 70s, the toxic politics that we live with today were born in the late 70s. In a six-month period of 1978, we had the tax revolt that rolled in from California. We had the Panama Canal Treaty fight, which broke new grounds in a serious policy issue, then becomes a vicious political fight with continuing resonance. We had the first rise, first showing of special interest political action committees, freed by Buckley versus Vallejo to get in. And so a flood of special interest action committees come in on abortion and guns issues. All the toxic elements of the politics that we live with today, I think, were born in the late 70s. And what I show here is that the Senate was strong enough to, to keep working, but then it changed. So what happened? And I'll try to be briefer. I get excited about the whole thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just get kind of into it. Um, what happened? Well. I finished my narrative and I with the 1980 election, which shattered the Senate. Uh, the greatest exodus of experienced, talented, accomplished, democratic, progressive senators, names that still resound, replaced by Republican neophytes, many of whom came to Washington without political accomplishments and left six years later with their record intact. <laughs> so, but, it didn't have to end up that way. And <laughs> when I was writing a book, Jack Danforth and Alan Simpson both separately said to me, Ira, we understand why you think 1980 was important. It was important. But we had a pretty good Senate in the 80s. You ought to take a close look at it. And so I looked at it. 
And they were right. There were still a lot of good senators around. They knew how to do business. And it, the Senate made a seemingly solid comeback in the mid to late 1980s. And then in the 90s, it started down. And it's been in what I consider to be a 20-year downward spiral since then. Now, when I wrote the epilogue, I figured I had to write an epilogue. So when I wrote the epilogue, basically, I thought it would be controversial. But I don't think it's controversial because it's so obvious. And the truth is, the relentless move of the Republican Party to the right uh, is the principal problem that the Senate has had. And the relentless move, senators that are more and more conservative, well, used to be the word conservative, senators that are further to the right, and the scholarship now exists that says these are the Gingrich senators, people who came to the House after Gingrich and have moved the thing to the right when they got to the Senate. Alan Simpson didn't engage in the scholarship. He said to me that the Senate changed when the battered children from the House came over, <laughs> led by Trent Lott. And I think that that's true. I think there's a lot of truth to that. And so over time, and you see, the, and you see a strategy that is a hyper-partisan strategy, and you've seen it pursued by several Republican leaders in a row, certainly Lott in my view, who is now making a lot of speeches about how bipartisan he was, but I think that's kind of revisionism. Lott, Frist, McConnell, the same strategy of basically turning the Senate more partisan and using the vulnerabilities of the Senate, because it's our most vulnerable institution. It can be tied up easily. Uh, they've used it very effectively to obstruct. And I think the country didn't really face this question, actually, and sort of get it until confronted with 2009, when President Obama came in with a clear majority in the midst of a national economic crisis, the worst in 80 years. And I always believed the national narrative that people came together in times of crisis. And that simply didn't happen that the Senate obstructed from the beginning, from the moment he got there. And I think that that showed how degraded the Senate had become, but it also was a, bad, a measure of how degraded our politics had become at that point. So the thing probably I should speak about, and but I'm not going to speak about it too much because we ought to talk, the question is can there be a next great Senate or even a mildly respectable one? And I think we should just throw that, since that's a hard question, I'll throw that to the panelists, but we can get into it. I think that the one thing I would say, uh, I've been talking to a number of the senators that are up there, Democratic and Republican, and I can say that although the public is very frustrated and angry about the Senate, a lot of the senators are too. They, but they seem to feel that they're powerless victims trapped in the uh, hyper-partisan system that has evolved. And my sympathy for them only extends so far. I don't think they're powerless victims. I think they have the power to change things, but they have to do it. So I'll leave it at that, and I apologize for getting carried away by my subject. Adam, why don't we start with you? Well, <clears throat> I want to recall something from the Panama Canal debate, or the politics of the canal, which I think makes the play, illustrates how different the place is today. Robert Byrd told Omar Torrios, the dictator in Panama, be patient because there weren't any senators who had anything to gain politically from supporting the treaties, and he thought they would ultimately, but it, was, it wasn't going to be easy. Um, well, at least a great many senators had political forebodings about what would happen to them if they voted for the treaty, and most of them voted against it. Uh, I mean, among the 
among the 32 who voted against the treaties, probably, probably half, if given truth serum, would have said that they were a good idea. But they had to vote against it to keep up their careers. Two of them told their wives something about their fear. Frank Church told Bethine after Carter had asked him to support the treaties, we'll only discuss this once. The Panama Canal is going to lose me the election. Tom McIntyre told his wife, Myrtle, come on and watch me lose my seat on the day of the first vote. But I wouldn't say that these are unique events, although it's hard for me to figure out just which current senators might do the same. There have been other senators who cast difficult votes in the history of it. John F. Kennedy wrote a book about a few of them. But one thing that I think is unique is Howard Baker. Howard Baker in the 70s was thinking very seriously of running for president. He, he wanted to. He hired a fellow who had worked for Nelson Rockefeller and Gerald Ford, and some of you may know another of those great Senate staff people, Jim Cannon. Uh, and Jim, he was canvassed his office on what he ought to do about the treaties when the when the issue came up. He wasn't eager to take on the issue. He said his reaction was initially, why me? Why now? But he thought he had to. He had to face the issue. Carter was bringing them up. And Cannon told Baker, you can't be nominated by the Republican Party for president if you support the treaties. And Baker's reaction was, so be it. Now, I can imagine uh, uh, senators present, I'm not sure, as I say, I'm not sure which ones, casting a vote that they think will cost them an election. I can't think of another example where somebody took a position which he thought would cost him the presidency. I'm not sure it did. I'm not sure he would have made it anyway. But that's what he thought. And, and he thought it was in the national interest, and so he supported it. I don't find that uh, anywhere else in the history of the Senate. Um, yeah, Ira, you asked us to address the question of whether there can be another great Senate. I, I feel uniquely unqualified <laughs> to answer that question because this was right before my time, this great Senate. I uh, first came to Washington, uh, and the first election that I sat through here was the 1980 uh, election. And I got to tell you, uh, when your first political experience is a landslide, I think I didn't have the proper perspective on it to know really what was happening around me. Um, and I covered Congress for a long time, first for CQ and the LA Times, but I guess I never really covered a great Senate, um, by your standards at least. Um, and actually, I think I didn't understand how really different the Senate was before that first election, and you did the honor of quoting my very favorite political reporter Alan Ehrenholt. And you cited in your epilogue an article that he wrote in 1982 that was very important in my own political education, because he described what the Senate was like before I was born, basically. It was, um, <laughs> it was an article that he, uh, I think it was the headlined The Individualist Senate. And he wrote it in 82. So it makes me think that some of the changes that you're talking about started even during the Great Senate of um, the kind of the collapse of some of the um, kind of communitarian instincts, but I, I, his words are so much better than mine, I'm going to read what you put in here, that he wrote, um, the Senate of the 1980s, team spirit has, in the Senate of the 1980s, team spirit has given way to the rule of individuals. This is Alan, Aaron Holt. Um, Every man is an island. Oh, and by the way, I knew Alan because he was the political editor at CQ when I was there. And whether he likes it or not, I give him credit for the fact that I ended up spending my entire career covering co Congress and politics. He's a brilliant man. Anyway, the article included a famous 1954 photo of Senators Jack Kennedy, Scoop Jackson, and Mike Mansfield playing softball. And this is Alan's words. The picture seems to stand for a Senate that has disappeared in the years since, one whose members knew each other well, worked and played well together, and thought of politics as a team game. Um, and it, it was a lovely picture. They ran this old picture with the article, and it was a lovely vision of the Senate, and we don't see very much of that today. Um, but I got to say, we don't see very much of that in society as a whole, and I sometimes find it a little bit um, 
hard to think about Congress just in isolation. I mean, a lot of what con Congress is in many ways a representative institution, and a lot of the problems that we see in, in the Congress we see in society as a whole. Um, I have to say, I was very interested in your comment about, um, about uh, the, the Gingrich Republicans in the Senate. Because uh, actually, I'm not covering Congress right now. I'm covering the presidential campaign. And so I've been giving more thought than usual, or for a while, to Newt Gingrich. And uh, on reflecting on his career in the House, I actually have kind of concluded that he is the godfather of American politics today, and the godfather of the Congress, and even the Senate, because yeah. he brought a change to the House and to Republicans' ways of thinking about their role as the minority that changed an entire generation of Republicans' way of behaving in Congress in particular, and that, that the institution was no longer a primarily or solely legislative branch, it became a political platform, and that he brought a different political strategy to the, legis the, role, the uh, legislative role that Republicans played, and famously clashed with Bob Michael about that, that the, the role of a Republican in the minority, as does that Don Wolfensberger down there? He knows. It's not to, to, to fiddle around the edges of legislation to make Democratic legislation a little bit more Republican. It's to fight, define the differences, win elections, and win a majority. And Newt Gingrich famously accomplished that. Uh, he also kind of brought in a new generation of Republicans who then went on to become senators. And I did a very quick count before I came here. And at least uh, just about half of the Republicans who are senators now served in the House. Most of, almost all of them overlapped with Newt. Some of them were, Newt was their formative influence. And they brought some of that kind of confrontational spirit to the Senate as well. And that's, that was a big, that was probably a bigger cultural change for the Senate than for the House, though it did come more gradually. Um, so I don't know. I, I mean, as a journalist, I mostly kind of think about how to explain what's going on than to see how, how things might be different. But I have to say, I also sympathized with your question at the outset about, in thinking about institutional change, whether you said something like, was this the great Senate because I was there and I was young? Because I have to say, I think about that too. You know, the 10 years that I was at CQ, the golden era oh, of CQ. Oh, My 15 years at the LA Times Washington Bureau, never been better. <laughs> you know, and, and David Wessel will be glad to know that I think this is the golden era of the Wall Street Journal Washington Bureau, so. And of the Wilson Center. <laughs> so anyway, I, you know, I, I, it is very hard for me to say, though, that this is the golden any anybody's golden era of Congress. I mean, I used to think I've I've covered Congress for a really long time, and I used to think that um, <coughs> Congress was a really misunderstood institution, and that if only people understood it better, they would have more respect for it. And that was why I felt a real sense of mission as a congressional reporter is that I was trying to explain it better so that maybe people would see it's not all that bad. But I got to say, I'm kind of having a harder time making that case anymore. So anyway, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Janet. Thank you, Adam. Very good. <laughs> would you like to respond to those thoughtful comments? Well, I just, I just wanted to make just a couple of comments because I think those were, of course, right on. There's a moment in my book, in the epilogue, where I describe January 1995, the Senate Republicans meet, and Trent Lott is challenging Alan Simpson to be the deputy leader. And Connie Mack stands up, new senator from Florida, stands up and says, we have a historic opportunity here. We can elect, as our deputy leader, a close friend and ally of Newt Gingrich's and we can unify the House Republicans and the Senate Republicans into a real force. Now, that kind of argument would have cut no ice in the Senate for many, many years. But at that moment, it cut enough ice that Newt, uh, Lott won by one vote, and the Senate changed su substantially. So it was Gingrich's direct effect and his indirect effect. Trent Lott wrote a fascinating memoir in 2006 in which he describes coming to the Senate and he just hated it when he got there. He hated everything about it, but he determined to change it. And he said, I have a clique of tough conservative people who are gonna help me change it. And they did change it, but they changed it in my view considerably for the worst. So the other thing I would say, I'm sure most of you saw the uh, what I consider to be a rather brilliant piece that David Brooks wrote this week about 
the Republican moves to the right and how each time the more moderate Republicans kind of go along with it and don't object, they get rolled over and the party moves further to the right and consumes people, basically. And two hours before I came here, there was a remarkable article, a release today, conservative activists prepared to call for McConnell to resign as leadership post. That Mitch McConnell, who in my view has been completely obstructive, 100% obstructive, the activists are saying he's not far right enough because he said we won't have another vote on Obamacare this year. And so it's a case, if you don't stand up to people and you constantly sort of go along, there's no end to where the thing goes. But, so I thought that was kind of an interesting, David Brooks, he wins his prizes for good reasons. He deserves it, it was a brilliant column. Let's that, that comment on yes, please. opportunity to ally with, with the House, not only would it have cut no ice, it would have turned votes against right, whoever exactly. was advocating it in the past. Right. I mean, the, the Senate and the House have never really liked each other. Right. Think of Tom Foley's famous comment that the Republicans are the opposition, the Senate is the enemy. <laughs> I, I think that goes back at least, I think that goes back at least to Raber. <laughs> oh, wait, maybe so. Maybe so. One little factoid to add to all this about Gingrich, and that is I was there. I was elected in 92, the so-called year of the woman. Everybody remember that? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the women elected to open seats, which was my case, out of 10, I think eight were defeated in 94. Mm. At any rate, I was there in 94. Tom Foley had been defeated, and uh, he was handing the gavel. Newt Gingrich had been elected the new Republican leader. And rather than hand the gavel to Newt Gingrich, which he did not do, he handed the gavel to Bob Michael, his partner and an institutionalist mm. in the way that he was. And Michael handed the gavel to Gingrich. That's, That's very interesting. Very interesting. Well, let's. I suspect there's one or two questions here. Uh, Mr. Jarbo, please, if you'll wait for the microphone and then introduce yourself. Mike here today? Yes, indeed. Uh, Ken Jarbo, I was part of the, the Senate staff in that rebound years in the, the 80s and, and 90s, uh, worked with Ira. Uh, Ira, the, the, the last things you just said uh, triggered a thought in me. To, to what extent is the institution simply reflecting the outside pressures um, that are happening, especially with the rise of, of money and the super PACs that you talked about. You know, the other, the other news today was the Koch brothers uh, suing Cato Institute over control of, of the institution. Um, and so this rise of the, of the right-wing money that's just flooded in since, since actually since Buckley Vallejo. So um, did you talk? Vallejo, excuse me. Thank well, you. look. I think there's no doubt, and I, sh I always should say this, but I think there's no doubt it's harder to be a senator now than it used to be. I think the demands of fundraising, the sheer amount of time they spend on fundraising is a real problem. The 24-hour media and the shrillness of it and a political conversation that often takes place more on Facebook and Twitter there's a lot of things that make it very, very difficult to be a senator. Um, but I, you know, my, I'm sort of old-fashioned. I think you still have to rise above it, basically. I'm not saying it's easy, uh, but I do think that there has been a concerted strategy, leadership-driven strategy, to turn the Senate into a partisan institution, a Republican strategy to do it. And I actually believe that, you know, I believe that leaders really make a difference. I believe that the Senate would function quite a bit differently if it was led by Dick Durbin and Lamar Alexander. I think it'd be functioning differently if it was led by Ben Cardin and Rob Portman. I think it could be functioning differently in a lot of ways because people have to sort of step forward and say, you know, I mean, basically, the Senate is the place where bipartisan comedy is the oxygen for it. I mean, you can't, 
That's where you're supposed to get the majority and the minority together. And we're sort of at bedrock here when we talk about our system because we don't have a parliamentary system. So our system is premised on some degree of minority cooperation. And what they showed in 2009 is they can do great damage if they don't cooperate. But ultimately, look, think about for a moment what would have happened in 2009 if in the economic crisis the congressional leaders, Democratic and Republican, had joined hands with President Obama and tried to work together. I think we would have had a better and faster economic recovery, but we certainly would have had a higher level of public confidence in the government. I think, I think people genuinely were horrified last August when they realized for the first time, these people may actually cause us to default. The inmates are really running the asylum here. So I think that, I think a lot of it's on the senators. Gentleman here. I'm Jim Byrne. I'm a longtime journalist. I interviewed Jack Kennedy when I was 19 years old for my college magazine. So I, and I didn't like him then, and I never liked him really. I'm, <laughs> I'm, way, to the, I'm way to the left of him. And, and of course, he did not write Profiles in Courage. He did not. Anyway, my question is this, though. Uh, the, uh, Nobody said that about me. Nobody, <laughs> nobody else will claim credit for writing this. I, I, uh, oh, I go back. I, I was the original editor of Tax Notes Magazine and hung out with Adam a lot. But the, uh, and I was at CQ. Alan Erholtz, one of my dearest friends, and I think highly of him. But uh, my question is, is to put your question to you. I'm, I'm probably older than you. I'm 74. But the... Um, I think a lot about this stuff, and I go, I live at think tanks, so I hear a lot of views. I heard David Brooks the other day brilliantly over at uh, Brookings uh, talking about uh, Bob Kagan's book, new book. Uh, I'm basically an optimist, and so I would answer your question, yes, but not with any evidence that we could have another great Senate. What do you think? <laughs> well, look, I, I think that I think there's more reason at the moment for being pessimistic than optimistic. I mean, there's a lot of forces at work, and we're already reading, you know, it's going to be partisan again, and nothing's going to improve, and now we're losing the remaining moderates that we had, and all those things. I think that we only get a respectable Senate again if the senators take it upon themselves to rise above what's going on. I mean, somebody said to me, you actually act, you act, you seem to expect the senators to rise above the vitriolic political culture in which they live. I said, yeah, that's exactly what I expect. Because the truth of the matter is, we can't stay around and wait for the campaign finance system to change. Or for, somebody said to me the other day, don't we really need more civic education? I said, yeah, we need more civic education, and we can't wait around for that either. And we actually can't even count on the greatest generation to bail us out. I mean, these senators have to, I think they need some new rules. I think they need new leaders. And I think they need a new attitude. They need to recognize that, you know, if you want to be in a partisan knife fight all the time, you should be at the DNC or the RNC or MSNBC. But you shouldn't be a United States senator. And you certainly shouldn't be a Senate leader. A gentleman there, I'm just, again, there you go. Wayne, <coughs> excuse me, Wayne Collins, I was a Senate staffer back in the good old days, 60 <laughs> to 68, and I, re I would like for you to comment on the makeup of the Senate during those years. There were no, basically, no Republicans from the South. They were uh, progressive senators from the East and a few like Tom Kegel from out West, but Ken Keating, Jacob Javits, those people. What do you think is the difference uh, when you look at the Senate from those years up to 1980 and uh, as it stands? No, of course, huge difference. Uh, you know, and, and as Janet or Adam would comment, I mean, 
obviously, the Republican Party has changed greatly in terms of fewer progressives and fewer moderates. It has changed dramatically in terms of regional makeup. I mean, look, the truth of the matter is we all know. Lyndon Johnson said after the 64 Civil Rights Act, we just lost the South. And the Republican Party had become a very much more southernized party after 1964. And so the, the remaining moderates in, in, the, in the Senate, and particularly those from the North, have been squeezed out. Uh, certainly, Olympia Snow's retirement uh, announcement that she's not going to run again focuses our mind on that. The, um, but I can't overstate, and this goes back to 1990, as far as 94, and the effect of Gingrich and Lott. At that point, the Republican leaders really started tightening the screws on all the senators for absolute unity. Jack Danforth tells the story in his book. Mark Hatfield, they put the screws to him to be for the balanced budget amendment to the point that he went to Bob Dole and he said, look, I'll resign if you want me to. I'm not going to vote for this, but you've got to stop this. Certainly, believe me, Susan Collins and Olympia Snow felt very lonely and very ostracized and very pressured in 2009 when they supported the economic stimulus. Now, that wasn't the way the Senate used to work. It wasn't just that they were more moderate. It was that if a senator, you know, they ask you for your vote, and if you told them they couldn't give you the, you, you weren't with them, that was it. There was this tolerance of different points of view in terms of ideas. There was a tolerance of people's political situations. I mean, I had an interesting conversation today with a young woman. We're, we're a much, many of us are a little older, but a young woman who was actually a producer at a certain right-wing net, network, Fox, <laughs> who said to me, I really enjoyed reading your book. She said, I, can't, I grew up very disillusioned about politics because no, you know, nobody could ever say anything good about anyone else. And, and she said, I'm amazed at the people you describe, where they actually found agreements on things and worked together even though they didn't agree on anything. And it struck me, I mean, and maybe this is sort of obvious, but I can't think of a moment in three years plus that McConnell has said a single positive word about Obama. And, you know, I would have more respect for him if he said, look, I don't agree with the president on a lot of things, but he's doing a really good job on X and Y. But that's never said. You know, he's completely, he condemns him totally. And whenever you see endless party line votes, you have to assume that people aren't using any independent thought because you don't get to a party line vote if you're, you know, if you're using independent thought. Can I just say two things um, mm -hmm. about bipartisanship and kind of how, I mean, what a lot of times what people are bemoaning is the absence of bipartisanship. And there is something, a lot to be said for bipartisanship, if only because I think when bills pass with bipartisan margins, they tend to be more durable. That they, that when you have a health care bill that's passed only by Democrats, when Republicans come into the power, first thing they want to do is repeal it, okay? So bipartisanship is a good thing. But it was a lot easier to be bipartisan when the Democrats had big factions of bull weevil conservative Democrats. It was, it's also easier to be bipartisan when you have a big majority so that, so that it's, you know, it's, it was particularly hard for Democrats to reach out to Republicans and vice versa when the Democrats had 59, 60 members of the Senate. Because, you know, that so long, I, I actually thought at the time that the Democrats would be better off if they weren't so close to 60. You know, you're either at 60 or you're not. And, you know, it, so long as, as every vote counts, there's a huge amount of pressure on the Olympia Snows of the world. She, would, she did much better at a time when the margins weren't so tight. So. Ira, let me ask you a question about what change that that group that you described, the greatest generation in the sense that came to the Senate, they had looked at, uh, they came with a confidence about what government could do. They had a sense that, that uh, a lot of good things had happened in fighting the Great Depression, one World War II, 
that the government really could take, could make positive steps in uh, influencing people. And then you had another generation that had a more seminal experience with Vietnam and the credibility gap and a misrepresentation. And then I think the country was shocked by Watergate. At least part of the country certainly was. Yeah. And by the end of the 70s, they, uh, we were talking about stagflation. There was a time, Time Magazine had economists on the cover. They figured out how to run the country. They didn't understand how it worked, but that was just terrific, you know. And then Nixon came out. We're all Keynesians now. And all of a sudden, it didn't work. And that opened the door for Ronald Reagan famously to say the government is the problem, not the solution. So that, that changed the life experience of a group of people who came to the Senate beyond partisanship. No, no, I, I think certainly, Kent, and you and I have talked about this a lot of times. I certainly agree that the 70s were a time when the country faced both a, the first evidence of a weakened economy, the long summer of post bra prosperity came to an end in 1973, and the world got very much different after that. If David Wessel's still here, I'm always fearful about talking about economics, but I think that that's basically true. And I also think that there was some, obviously there was a reaction to large government programs and a feeling that, you know, the government had taken on a lot and perhaps they had taken on too much. Certainly, Ronald Reagan will always be remembered, you know, for kind of saying the same things from 1964 to 1980. But by 1980, the world came around to him a little bit. But even, you know, even Carter, during the, Dem you know, the last Democratic administration in the 70s, he was trying to sort of, he had an anti-government flavor to him, too. So clearly it's different. But these things go in cycles. And, you know, the Reagan years were presumably somewhat better years for the country. And then Clinton came in at, after Bush. Clinton came in. There was a sort of more positive view of what government could accomplish. But as a secular, in terms of secular decline, the Senate has fa failed us when the economy was prospering in the 1990s. It failed us after 9-11. It failed us throughout the Bush years. And now it's still failing us. So I think it's been a 20-year downward spiral for the Senate. Uh, and it, it's the reason I wrote the book was was a concern that it was our most vulnerable institution, and I wanted to at least remind people of what senators did and how the Senate worked when it worked. Not on, and then the gentleman over there. Oh, I'm sorry. Please no, jump in. I, I well, I, I'd like to that, offer um, one thought in minor minor defense of the Senate. And that is, you knew from the day that the Democrats took over the Senate in, in 2009 that the Republicans were not going to play. And the Senate, you know, that they were, not, they were going to oppose almost everything. They were certainly going to oppose health care. Now, I, the Democrats managed to pass a bill. Now, whether it will survive, and obviously Janet's right, these things would have a much better chance of surviving if they had had both parties. But I'm not sure that I'd fault the, de fault the Democratic Senate for passing it. No. Uh, it was, it's a major commitment to trying to solve a major problem. And if the other guys say, we're taking our ball and going home, that, you know, get your own ball and you do what you can. Mm -hmm. Don, and then the gentleman over here. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Don Wolfensberger. I run the Congress programs here at the uh, Wilson Center. Spent 28 years in the House, mostly with the House Rules Committee, uh, 12 with John Anderson, uh, 8 with Trent Lott. Two different types of Republicans. Both were institutionalists. I don't like it when you demonize somebody and, and make it sound like they are the fault of everything going wrong. I, I, I really resent that. They both believed in the institution. I think Trent continued to when he was in the Senate. He had his differences, obviously, with the Democrats. I s attended the uh, program a couple weeks ago with Lott and Daschle, and there were a lot of areas in which they did work together on things, and they agreed on that. There were other things where they could not agree. 
But, you know, I, I think to, to say that it's, it's all black and white, that when Republicans took over, everything went bad and everything was good before, I, I'm a little bothered by that. The other thing, though, is the idea of parliamentary government. People say, gee, it's too bad we don't have a parliamentary form of government, but we almost do. We, we have conditional party government right now, and that's what we, when you talk about the discipline in the two parties, all right, members are not acting independently as much as they used to. They're working more with their party. Why? Because, as Janet pointed out, you've got close margins in both bodies. It could flip either way in any election, and so members are trying to work together for their programs. When I was a political scientist in the 1960s, the liberal Democratic college professors would say, we need more of a parliamentary system. Parties don't mean anything now. They've got to mean stand for something. What happened? Parties started to stand for something, beginning in about the 1980s. Now they are poles apart, granted, and that makes it more difficult to find common ground. But I think the, the fact that they do stand for something now says something about the development of the parties, that they are no longer content with being mishy-mushy in the middle, agreeing just to scratch each other's backs and get more pork for our districts or our states. They do differ on things like the size and role of government, on taxes, things of this nature. So I just you know, want to throw in that little qualifier that I, I think that uh, Republicans are not the, the, the reason for things going differently. The fact is things were very partisan even before the Republicans took over. I was there during the Vietnam War debates, some of these other things where you know it really got heated after Nixon took over when he was winding down the war. It wasn't that fierce when Johnson was still president. He had to step aside, I know, because of a challenge. But the fact is, things got much nastier after Nixon took over as president. Okay. Well, Don, I hope um, if you, I hope you'll read the whole book because I think you'll feel better about the book. I mean, rather than because I think the book was about a period of time, and I think it is regarded as a fair book and not a not a partisan book. The epilogue which I felt the need to write to connect, try to explain what I thought had happened the last 30 years does sound more partisan because I actually do believe that the explanation I offer is accurate and I don't believe that the fault is equally shared. And I really was quite struck as I, I don't know Senator Lott uh, actually at all. Uh, my main view of Senator Lott was based on his memoir. Uh, so the way he dis adjusted to the Senate and the way he viewed the Senate when he came over. Um, but, you know, look, people, not everyone's going to agree with my book. That, that's, part, that's part of life. But I do think that, you know, Vietnam is an interesting example because the opposition to the Vietnam War during the Johnson, you know, when Johnson was president, most of the opposition, not all of it, came from Democrats. When Nixon became president, the opposition by Democrats continued and perhaps intensified because it was now time to try to end the war. But if we think about uh, McGovern Hatfield, uh, Cooper, Ch you know, Church Cooper, you know, you Charles Goodell, Javits and Eagleton working on the War Powers Act, you find Democrats and Republicans working on the war thing too. So. But anyway, nobody's, not everyone's going to agree with me on every point. <laughs> the gentleman over here. I'm Mark Gruenberg. I, I run a news service here in town, and like Janet Cook, I'm an old CPU alumna from the same era. Uh, we've been talking mostly about the Republicans' responsibility, but let's talk a little bit about the Democrat, the de Democratic leadership, or maybe their <laughs> lack of leadership in reaction to it. Um, I've gotten the impression over these last couple, over these last 30 years that the Democrats have still tried to play by the old rules while the rules have changed in so many words. And I would apply that particularly to Tom Daschle and also apply it, I realize we're going back to the House, to Dick Gephardt, who had to take over as minority leader after uh, the Republican Revolution in 1994. Gephardt was still trying to play by the old rules and Newt Gingrich changed the rules. Talk about the other the other side of the aisle and whether they have to go in the same direction or not, or if they do. Well, I mean, look, I actually I agree with your point. I basically believe that the Democrats 
attempted to continue, you know, with the old rules, and essentially it didn't work because there was a considerable change in the Republican approach and the Republican strategy. And I guess the, one of the examples I would give, I mean, if you look at the recent presidencies, you know, what you discover is Democrats in the Congress seeming, in the Senate, seeming to try to work with Republican presidents. I mean, let's remember that George W. Bush got the Bush tax cuts through the, the, the Congress by May of 2001. Uh, he wouldn't have gotten it through without Max Baucus. He wouldn't have gotten No Child Left Behind through without Ted Kennedy. Bush was a Republican president. He came in in very controversial circumstances, and yet he got a shot at his agenda. He got some support. You don't see that with Bill Clinton in 1993, and you don't see that with Barack Obama in 2009. So yes, I do believe that the Republicans have changed the, their approach and the rules. And then the Democrats are faced with a difficult task, a difficult choice. Do we respond in kind so that things just spiral downward? I mean, look, we're going to face this question next year. I mean, if, if uh, the Republican nominee, if it's Romney, if Romney is elected president, his only hope his only hope is that the Democrats won't behave the way the Republicans have to Obama. And, you know, that might be true, but it might not. It's hard to know. What I've been talking about is trying, you know, asking senators in both parties, what do you have to do to rise above this, S seek some higher ground? Because right now, it's been a downward spiral for a long time. Adam, well, one, do you have hmm. one? One reason for this is that there's something fundamentally different about the parties today. The Democrats, by and large, to, to a considerable degree, believe in government, and the current Republicans don't. Therefore, it's easier for the Democrats to cooperate with a Republican president than for Republicans to cooperate with a Democratic president. That's a good point. A gentleman all the way in the back there? My name is Adrian Robinson. I intern for uh, Congressman Dutch Ruppersberger. And um, I believe that change begins with the youth. And President Obama did a very excellent job uh, of bringing the youth from Quasness to arousal during the 2008 election. But after the election, it seems like the youth went right back to doing what they were doing before. So my question is, what can we do to better engage the youth and get them off of the couch watching MTV and into the political arena? Good question, Ira. Well, I mean, I, on the one hand, I thought it was inspiring the way young people were brought into the process and excited about Barack Obama. Uh, certainly, you know, my daughter, my daughter's a little older, but my son had never been interested in politics until the Obama campaign. I think, though, that it's not, and, uh, and we all know that, you know, the, the election was over and people get less active. They go on with their lives, basically. It's not actually supposed to be a permanent campaign. You're supposed to gear up for a campaign, somebody wins the election, and gets the chance to govern. That's the problem I have, basically, with the Republicans, because it hasn't, they haven't, there hasn't been that chance. I think that people, hopefully, will gear up again. On I'm sure they'll gear up on both sides as the campaign heats up again. But I don't, I don't fault young people for sort of going back to work or going back to school or doing whatever they were doing and not treating it as a four-year political campaign. The government is supposed to work in the interim. The other thing I'll point out is there is this huge youth, youth resurgence going on in the Ron Paul campaign. I mean, he, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the turnout uh, for Ron Paul is like heavily driven by young people. I don't know what's going on there. But Have you talked to them? Yeah, what is the explanation, <laughs> General? I don't know. I mean, I think, I think he has that kind of, you know, anti-establishment mojo that 20-year-olds mm -hmm. like, you know? <laughs>
And he is candid. I mean, he yeah. means yeah, what he's he blonde. says. He's blonde. You know, he's got kind of a low rent kind of approach to campaigning. It's not like this sort of slick Mitt Romney thing that look that looks more like a kind of a corporate production. His is more the entrepreneurial campaign. Yes, the gentleman there. Okay, thank you. My name is Christopher Kraus. Um, uh, the you've touched on the topic of the blogosphere and sort of the shrill shrillness of the conversation. I was wondering if maybe I've also heard it referred to as the uh, hyperbole that we're debating. Uh, the political debate has a lot, much too, far too much hyperbole in it. And so, how can 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 someone rise above that hyperbole? I guess, and still with in this in this environment that we're that we're dealing in, where just getting the, someone's attention, they have you know maybe 30 seconds to convey an idea, whereas maybe back in the golden age, they would have had a minute or two minutes to, to lay something out. Yeah. Um, and also, I haven't heard anyone mention that the airplane. I've heard this mentioned before that the airplane and the, the ability to travel more frequently back to home districts, especially on weekends, has limited the amount of time that um, the senators are actually in DC and that can actually sit down and do business together. I'm wondering if maybe you could comment on that. Well, I guess taking the last point first, I think there's no doubt that the airplane uh, campaign finance demands and even the, the way the Senate runs, the technology, uh, has changed the amount of time senators spend together. When I was first working there, the Senate wasn't televised, but it wasn't even televised back to the offices. So what happened was, you know, if you wanted to know what was going on, the senators would really wander over to the Senate. They'd go to the cloak rooms, they'd eat lunch there, they'd sort of hang out. You know, they'd do the hearings in the morning and then they would go over there. So there was a lot more time for interaction. Now it's much different, you know, they're sort of running their staffs, they're in their office if they're not traveling, so everything's different. There's no question about it. Um, you know, it, you're, you're raising a fundamental question. I mean, how, how, to be, how to be heard, you know, when there's so much noise out there and you have to, you don't have a lot of time and it tends to, uh, it tends to make you sharpen your points and perhaps may sharpen your points excessively. I think that, and I'm, you know, I'm sure I'm guilty of it too. I think that one senator, you know, I think, I think the reason I kind of focus on the Senate is because I think they should have pride in being there. And I think there's a, it's a relatively limited number of people. And it wouldn't take that many people in terms of attitude to change the culture, basically. I'm not, they're not going to secede from the overall society. They can't exempt themselves from it. But I think that they can have, I think they can have a more serious debate. And I think they can also, I believe they should change certain of the rules that allow, and, and this, these are not rules, I would protect the minority party, whoever the minority party was. But I don't accept the view that individuals should be able to shut down the Senate. Uh, by, and, and there, Senator Lott and I agree because in his memoir, he says, when did these holds get out of hand? It used to be just a courtesy to someone who had a real interest in the legislation and, and was away or something. And all of a sudden, they become a method by which one person can hold up legislation indefinitely, hold up a nomination indefinitely. There are parliamentary experts who will go to great lengths to tell you that the Senate rules really work. Don't believe them. I actually don't think that's true. And I don't think, and I don't think we should be working under rules that give as much power to individuals, whatever point on this political spectrum they occupy. Well, one reason that holds have multiplied <clears throat> is that Lot didn't deal with them the way Dole did. When Dole was leader, there were a lot fewer effective holds because Dole said to some of them and to enough of them to make an impression, all right, let's see your, let's see your 41 votes. 
you know, we'll bring it up. Uh, I mean, the hold is a threat to filibuster. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody, everyone backs off the threat, leaders of both parties. I don't know that you could, s s to the point where it's become epidemic, and I'm not sure that, well, although since the Senate is doing very little else, they could probably hold cloture votes on every threatened hold and not diminish their legislative output much. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take the lady here and the lady back there and then make those the last two questions. We'll take them together and then I want to give our panel and Ira a chance for a last word. I'm really glad you've written this book. This was my generation and all that you've said has been absolutely wonderful. Um, just a Two things. Number one, I blame a lot on President Obama. I'd like to see him be a whole lot more proactive in bringing the parties together. I think that he has receded perhaps out of fear because he wants to be reelected or whatever, but I'd like to see him behave a little more like LBJ and some of the other presidents. He is not proactive enough, in my opinion, and I voted for Obama. Uh, the second thing, I'd like to see a woman step up to the plate. Let's see how strong some of the women in the Senate really are. Perhaps the lady from New York. But there are things that are just so uneven or so unequal that you know we're only talking about the gentlemen in the Senate. What about the ladies? Lady. I know you are Paula, but I'm being, I'm simply being discreet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the question right before about the ladies, Ira gets a lot of credit in my book because he does diligently throughout the book point out uh, the composition uh, of uh, the gender composition. Um, uh, both of the staff and the senators. He's very conscious of that. Um, my, my question is really a, a, a hypothesis, and you can, we can take it offline, but there was a discussion about how um, the Republicans basically, um, the Democrats basically um, flipped uh, in the South to become, if you will, Republicans. And you mentioned it was LBJ saying, "There it goes with the uh, voter, with the Voting Act or the, um, the Civil Rights Act." But my hypothesis is that it's even worse than that. That uh, that shift came, in and you felt it in the Senate, um, actually with Brown versus Board of Education, because what happened is that it, uh, this is a hypothesis that so many people in the South basically took their kids out of public schools and they created Christian academies. Mostly they were Christian academies, religious academies, let's just call it that. And it created a certain, um, and many of which were very fundamentalists. I, I, coming from the South, I feel like I can say this, I'm from Memphis, they were like madrasas. Um, we had our own madrasas, and that has created this kind of tone, this lack of tolerance, um, and uh, it might have been that everybody was scratching their own back back in the 50s and the 60s, but I do think at least it, there was more tolerance, and I think it, it, it has colored, um, if you will, uh, what we have today in the Senate. Um, and, and, and it's just, it's a hypothesis. I hope maybe the Woodrow Wilson Center will get some scholar to explore that notion, why there was that shift, because we're all sitting scratching our heads, well, it's because of the Republicans. But it's, but that came about from something else. Ira, why don't you answer these two questions, and then we, I want to give Adam and Janet a, a last word, and you a final, final word. Well, I, I on the on the women uh, question, actually, I I've, I think that the only improvement in the Senate is the fact that it is no longer an exclusively male club. I think the fact we don't have 50 women or we don't have 40 women, but 17 or whatever we were up to is a significant change in the Senate. 
And I say in my epilogue that apparently they feel, you know, they're, they're a close bond between the women. Uh, Barbara Mikulski's the dean of the group, and they feel a closeness. But what I also say is it hasn't affected the overall Senate very much. I mean, they have not been able to overcome what I consider to be the general mood of the Senate. Um, but certainly, you know, I think having more women there is, is, is a real advance. I, Paula, I hadn't thought about your hypothesis at all, um, and, that's, and I, I'd like to think about it. What I would say, um, the factor that I often cite as something that I think has changed the political debate uh, is the abortion issue. I don't believe, I don't believe that any of us, well, I don't believe that most of us would have thought in 1973 when Roe versus Wade was decided that nearly 40 years later the issue would be as hot as it is. And because it is a profoundly, uh, deeply held and religious issue for people, it is not an issue that lends itself to compromise and it seems to radiate out touching a lot of other issues and making it harder and harder to compromise. Now, in certain areas that are religious and close to abort the abortion issue, I understand it. I don't think that taxes ought to be a religious issue. I mean, you know, it, but the ability to comp, you know, the, I think it has infected, that's one of my theses, is that that has infected the political debate. But I hadn't thought of yours. Adam, Janet, a last word? Well, I retired from the Times before Facebook was widespread and before Twitter had been invented. And people would sometimes ask me, well, do you have a solution for the breakdown in politics? And I would say then, this was nine years ago, well, I'd be willing, I'd be willing to make the sacrifice of giving up ESPN if we simply disinvent cable television, <laughs> which, was, which was the first f form of 24-hour-a-day partisanship, which now has been technologically superseded. But. Janet? Yeah, um, I am tempted to end on an optimistic note, which is to say, you know, it's not that bad. You know, like there, we can't say that the whole, I think I disagree that it's been a steady 20-year decline or failure. You, you said it was just an outright failure for 20 years. And I do think, you know, the, the, the criticism of Congress that I think is most um, unjustified, and you're not, the, this isn't what you're saying, but the do-nothing Congress thing, Congress actually does a lot. And you may or may not like what they do, but the health care bill, partisan or not, was a very big, difficult thing to do, and Congress did it. The Bush tax cuts, you may think that they were in the long-term calamitous, but you know, at the time, <laughs> Congress was looking and saying, you know, we got this big surplus, and let's stimulate the economy, or no child left behind. Maybe it was a good faith effort to address a problem. So if we can just kind of give a little bit of credit that Congress has tried to tackle some big problems over the last decade, Dodd-Frank, didn't solve the whole problem of the financial resources services industry, but it was an attempt. So I try to temper my cynicism and my skepticism as a reporter with a little bit of humanity, which is these. there are a lot of, of people trying hard. The system, I think, is probably undercutting a lot of the people of goodwill, but to kind of, we have to be careful not to write off the whole institution. I do think that the answer of whether there's another great Senate before us probably doesn't come from looking backwards, but from looking forwards, because a lot of the stuff that was going on there, we just can't get back. We cannot unplug cable TV. I'm sorry, we're just stuck with it, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I guess I, I, I really, I don't, I don't know what the answer is, except to try to assume that, that people are basically that there are people of goodwill in public service, we just have to find a way to help them do, do what they're doing, what they can do to make things better. Well, that's, I think that's a good note to end on because I almost never end up as the cynic, cynic or the pessimist, um, and Janet has reminded me that perhaps I'm veering too far to that. 
I mean, I have always taken the view that there are a lot of good people uh, up there, and I know that they're working hard. Uh, I think they've gotten, they feel trapped in the system that has evolved and a hyper-partisan model by, by which they know that they're working hard, but ultimately they're not able to have the effect that they do. Now it is true, and Carl Levin said this to me, at the end of 2010 or in 2011 he said, you know, it was the most frustrating Congress I've ever been in. We accomplished some really big things. Uh, you know, and he pointed to the big things that Janet has just described. But he said, but day to day, it's so frustrating, you can't get anything done, anything else done. So, you know, I think that I very seldom have to acquire my humanity from someone else, but I'm willing to take it. Um, I didn't mean to when, when I ran, uh, 10 years ago when I ran for Congress, um, I was very proud that one of the local newspapers uh, said that my campaign had been the antidote to cynicism that I had promised to deliver. <laughs> and I was hoping that the book could still be an antidote to cynicism, so I'll try to make my comments accordingly. <laughs> but thank you all. Please join me in a round of applause. A terrific panel. Iris, outstanding.